Um, good evening, everyone, um, and thank you all for attending tonight's event. Um, my name is Zachary Gratishar, and I'm currently a senior here at American University. Um, I have the pleasure of serving as chapter president of AUPRSSA for the 2021-2022 academic year, and I will be moderating tonight's event. With that, I want to take a moment to welcome you all to AUPRSSA's Mocktails, which is an annual networking event we host. Um, this is an event that we as a chapter put on every year. It would typically be done in person. However, due to the circumstances of COVID-19, we are conducting this event online. Uh, we have some great guest speakers joining us this evening um, that we are so honored to have. Um, before we get into the event, I just want to uh, take a moment to briefly explain how tonight's event will go. Uh, the first half of the event, roughly the first 30 minutes or so, uh, we will hear from our wonderful guest speakers as they take time to discuss a little bit about their careers and background in their respective fields. For the second half of the event, we will be creating two different breakout rooms, um, giving you all the opportunity to network with the wonderful guests we have here tonight. Um, you will be given approximately 15 minutes per breakout room to network. Um, and in the breakout rooms, feel free to ask any questions, um, and, you know, get a chance to network one on one with um, with the guests. Um, so without further ado, let's get right into tonight's event. So as I said um, before, Mocktails is a PRSSA tradition. Um, it's one of our bigger events that we host in the spring. Um, these are just a couple pictures from the last time we hosted the event in person, um, which was back in February of 2020. So right before the pandemic hit. We are so lucky to not have such great speakers, but also some great fields of PR and communications represented tonight, um, including nonprofit, crisis, entertainment, and government. Before I introduce our lovely guest speakers, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge my fellow eBoard members, for which I'm so incredibly thankful to have. Um, we have Elizabeth John, who serves as our Vice President and Finance Director. Scarlett, who is our Eagle Comms Director. Margaret, who is our VP of Membership and Events. Vestisha, who is our VP of Diversity and Inclusion and Service. Sophie, our wonderful VP of Digital Communications. Renee, our VP of Web Development. And also Katie, who is our VP of Alumni Relations. In addition to our wonderful eboard, we also could not have achieve half the things we do without the wonderful professional advisor, um, Anthony LaFaust, and then of course, the one and only, Gemma Puglisi, who has been with us thick, through thick and thin, through the pandemic and everything, and has been a wonderful faculty advisor for our chapter for the last 15 years. Um, so without further ado, let's get right into uh, meeting with our guest speakers. So first up, we have Alyssa Romano. Alyssa currently serves as the Vice President of Communications at Octagon Sports and Entertainment Agency. Uh, Alyssa, at this time, I invite you to say a few words and talk a little bit about your background. Well, um, it's nice to virtually meet everybody um, going first. I'm not sure exactly if I'll set the right path for what everyone else is going to share, but a little bit about me. Um, I played lacrosse at American and have always had sports as a part of my life. While I was at AU, I interned in the athletic communications department and really enjoyed working on a variety of different sports, whether that was lacrosse because I was playing it or basketball, learned a lot about volleyball and swimming at the time. And when the lacrosse season was over, which is a spring sport and everyone else was looking for jobs, I was very focused at the time on winning a Patriot League championship. Um, instead of looking for jobs, I decided I'm going to go to grad school because I didn't have the time at that point to really job hunt. So I went to grad school at Georgetown, just down the street, and got my master's in sports management. And as a part of that, um, you had to have an internship. And I interned at Octagon. And I have been there now for 11 years, which is really crazy to say. Um, and I oversee PR for all of the athletes that we represent and the broadcasters. So Octagon is a global uh, sports marketing and talent representation agency. We have offices um, in Beijing, in Portland, Maine, in LA, in McLean, Virginia, um, all over the globe. And I specifically focus on NBA, WNBA, NFL, NHL, 
and our broadcast talent, a little bit of uh, MLB as well. And that can be anything from pitching stories about what our athletes are doing off the field, whether that's charity, or if they're designing their own fashion line, or if they're getting into pet adoption to some crisis management stuff, if there are some tweets that go out that shouldn't be going out, if there are some drunk driving incidents, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and then bigger picture, working with our agents, if they're signing a new contract and figuring out what new market they're going to be in, what's the strategy when the athlete gets to the market. Um, so it really spans the gamut, but I get to oversee all of our sports, which is really unique. Um, and then most recently started building out my teams. Now I also oversee our social media and digital strategy team, which is about four people and really helping our athletes figure out how they want to tell their stories on their social platform. So Octagon also does sports marketing for big brands like BMW, Castrol, Home Depot. So if you ever see those brands, um, anything in sport, they, they touch our Octagon team supports that. So the other part of my job is to connect um, the brand side of our business with the app side of our business. And that really is focused on like interpersonal communication. So it's a lot of external PR, pitching media, building relationships with our athletes, but it's also internal comms and making sure everybody's connected. Thank you so much, um, Alyssa, for taking the time to speak to us and telling us more about your background. Um, so next, we have Richard Levick. Um, Richard Levick is a chairman and CEO of Levick, a crisis communications and public affairs firm representing countries and companies in the highest stakes global matters, the Venezuelan crisis, the Chinese trade war, the Gulf oil spill, Guantanamo Bay, the Catholic church, and many others. He and his firm have represented more than 300 of the world's largest law firms, hundreds of companies in over 30 countries, providing heads of state with communications access and insight into Washington. Um, Richard, I invite you to take a moment to say a few words and tell us a little bit about your background. Well, Zach, actually, I'd rather not. You did such a nice job in the introduction. Can I just call it quits and say thank you? <laughs> that was great. And so thank you so much. And you know, it's always great working with Gemma and Zach. We just started working together the last month or two on this, but your your spirit, energy, enthusiasm, and organization have just made this a real pleasure and very uh, easy. So. By way of background, my connection to AU is that I did go to law school there, and then I taught uh, at AU for uh, seven years over in the School of Public Affairs Leadership Program. By way of background, in terms of our firm, Zach gave a pretty good, uh, uh, great uh, introduction into the firm. We do handle the highest profile matters in the world. The firm started out 25 years ago being the world leader in law firm communications, that is representing the law firm's. But within about four or five years, we had really morphed to the law firm clients, that is handling the high profile matters. And, and Zach did a great job of going through uh, a lot of them. You know, today was, uh, in terms of issues, a little bit on uh, what is the probably the world's largest intellectual property matter, that is CRISPR, the DNA technology over who owns that. Uh, a lot dealing with... Uh, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, uh, and a, hand, you know, a handful of other matters as well. In terms of things that we've handled very recently, the Surfside condo collapse tragedy, which I'm sure you're all familiar with from this past summer. And I think that's really interesting because, you know, of all, as you can imagine, doing a lot of international representation, getting involved in all these high profile matters, you have, you know, you fly into different countries, you fly into Korea for a meeting, you arrive, and then you're immediately escorted into a meeting before you even have a chance to check into your hotel or in the Middle East or wherever. But probably the most challenging and painful meeting was less than you know, 72 hours after the Surfside uh, collapse. It was probably the angriest uh, meeting I ever had. They weren't sure if they were going to hire us yet, and we've been pulled in by the lawyers uh, we were uh, the collapse that occurred at 1 a.m. Friday morning, late Thursday night. We got the first call Friday night. Uh, the meeting with the lawyers was Saturday night. You, you guys are having a pretty good idea of how I spend my weekends. So I'm a you know wild and crazy guy here. And then uh, Sunday night was with some of the surviving board members. Uh, and they, as you can imagine, they were frightened. 
They were getting death threats. They were angry. They didn't know where their anger should go. So there was anger at us. And we were, you know, we had to do the meeting just like this because it was during COVID. So it was by Zoom. And I like to be there in person. Uh, Pre-COVID, it was on a plane pretty much at, you know, uh, two times a week, somewhere in the world, and having to do that and, and share emotionally with them. And what I realized during that call was 20 years earlier, I could not have done that. I would have gotten a little defensive as they were angry. Why, you know, why are we talking to you? Well, how are you going to help? And what I would have said 20 years earlier was, well, you know, you called us. But instead, I very patiently and very hopefully um, empathetically uh, let them know that I understood, and I do understand having been the recipient of death threats. And, you know, we handled the Boko Haram kidnappings of, out of Nigeria. Have, uh, so death threats are not unusual. A lot of the high profile matters of the Middle East protest and uh, online attacks and whatnot, but being able to really understand their pain and to be able to communicate. And of course, uh, you know, they hired us um, later that night what I think is so important was that in those first 72 hours, all of the media thought they, the board, was the guilty party. And in the last uh, 48 hours, there was a settlement and the board is, was uh, not guilty of uh, uh, any of the crimes originally alleged. But what's really important is in crisis communications, you have the ability to change history to be there at the most critical moments and make a difference. And that's, you know, as a lawyer, as someone who's uh, another degree, environmental communications, I find that ability to, to be a protagonist to history to be, I think, one of the most rewarding things. Before this presentation, I was thinking, what is it that makes a great employee, particularly what makes a great young employee? And, you know, there's seven or eight things that I think are really important. Uh, there's certainly a lot more, but I read everything, critically important. I think our strongest, one of the most powerful employees we have is only 10 years older than most of you. And yet I trust him. We've been on a couple of business trips the last uh, two weeks on very high profile matters. And he's, he's just terrific. And what is it that are the skills that he has? So reading everything, being able to write exceptionally well. And I think one of the great challenges of social media is we think that great writing is reduced down to 280 characters, how critically important it is to be powerful. You know, Winston Churchill said that anything longer than a page is wasted paper. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And, you know, I'm a college professor as well. I teach over at Fordham Law and I used to teach at AU. And I know that, you know, what's the first question we ask when we get a term paper? How long? <laughs> you know, and that's like asking, you know, when someone says, I love you, well, how long, you know, how long are you going to love me for? I mean, right. I mean, it's about the passion. It's about getting the information of what we call bluff, the bottom line up front. It's so important. And as an executive, I get three, four, 500 emails a day. Sometimes I get a, a 15 minute notice before I have to go talk to a reporter or an hour notice before I go on TV. I want someone who can brief me and understands the wheat from the chaff, understands what the most important issues. And if you want to learn how to be a great briefer, look at, uh, watch old MASH episodes with Raider O'Reilly, who could just get to the bottom line right away. The, I, I think also abundance mentality. If you haven't read Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he, he, one of the habits is abundance. And abundance is someone who understands that there's always more and more opportunities. If you think that the road to success is about stepping over others, you're, you're, for me, you know, you're not the kind of team player that I want to be with. I want people who have abundance mentality, who welcome challenges to the ideas, who feel comfortable and confident to challenge me. You want to be able to debate issues. Never more difficult now, and we can, you know, during the breakout group, if you want, talk about how overly sensitive I think people are so that we don't get a chance to do constructive criticism. We don't get a chance to have honest conversations. We don't have a chance to look at things from multiple points of view so critical. That's another skill the Buddhist skill, you know, the Buddhists say, talk to people in the center of the forehead. That is, what are they thinking? I know all of you have been on a date where it's, you cannot wait to get home because every sentence that he says is I, I, I. And what we want is someone to be thinking, what, are, what matters to us? And that's so critically important. I like to spend my time 
viewing potential clients and clients from their perspectives, but also understanding what are the adversaries thinking and what are, what are they doing? Uh, the last couple of things I'll say, and then uh, turn it back over to Zach, is you want to be independent thinkers. Everything is ultimately a Hegelian dialectic that is like the grandfather clock going back and forth. I don't really care what's popular. I care from a historical spec perspective, from a legal perspective, from a business perspective, what's right. And as a crisis firm, our job is not ever to put lipstick on a pig, but it's to fix things, to make them right to help get it right. And the only way that you can do that is to keep true to your North Star, to do the right things even when no one else is watching. So with that, Zach, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Richard. That was, you had me, I'm just captivated by that. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and without further ado, we will move on to um, our next guest speaker who's with us tonight, Ryan Jordan. Uh, Ryan currently serves as the Manager of Advertising Media at FX Networks. Ryan Jordan completed her graduate degree at American University here in Washington, D.C. in the Strategic Communications Master's Program. In 2017, Ryan moved to Los Angeles to pursue her career in media and marketing. She began her career on the West Coast as a summer intern at ESPN. She considers herself the luckiest intern that year as she not only worked directly with ESPN's affiliate and sales marketing teams, but she also had the opportunity to learn from Disney's other properties like uh, ABC, Freeform, Marvel, Pixar, and Lucasfilms. In 2019, she joined Vice as media strategist, planning and executive executing um, media campaigns across their digital and linear platforms. After being in that role for over a year, she transitioned to becoming a senior account manager where she worked on creating branded content across Vice and Refinery29. During that time, um, she created and led a new initiative called Black Plus, Vice Media's group's commitment to supporting Black-owned businesses in partnership with the National Urban League, which we love. Um, Ryan recently joined the advertising and media team at FX as a manager where she currently works on executing media campaigns and creating promotional materials for their award-winning TV shows. Um, and with that, Ryan, I will uh, throw it to you to talk a little bit more about your background. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for that intro. I'm like, what else do I say? Um, but yeah, I'm very excited to see you all. So um, as Zach said, I actually graduated from AU about five years ago. So not too um, far removed from, from my days on campus. Um, but actually, Alyssa, from your, from your bio intro, I think we have a lot in common. So I, I actually played basketball in undergrad. Um, and then similarly, wasn't quite ready to join the workforce just yet. So that's when I actually started my graduate uh, program um, at American University, um, did the one year master's program in strategic communication, where I got to work very closely with uh, Gemma, Gemma, very, had a great time that one year um, and then kind of pursued my dream of always uh, moving to the West Coast. Um, so then I, I completed a summer internship with uh, ESPN, uh, like Zach mentioned, um, and I definitely um, can share some info that I learned, um, you know, as an undergraduate student and as a graduate student for some um, like internship programs that help um, specifically help like people with diverse backgrounds get internships and, and even scholarship if, if you're looking for that. So I can definitely talk about that in the breakout rooms. Um, but yeah, I've just, I've kind of stayed in the media entertainment world here in LA. So I uh, did an internship at ESPN, um, worked at a media agency. So if anyone's interested in kind of media planning, understanding the um, marketing media side of things and how, whenever you see an ad anywhere, how it gets there, I can kind of break that down as well. Um, if, if you're interested in, in learning about working at a publisher, that's what a uh, vice media group, um, Vice.com, Vice TV, Refinery29, that's where um, I've been the past couple of years um, working both on the media side and then on branded content, which is whenever you see a, a video on a website and it says sponsored by Coca-Cola or something like that, there's a lot, a lot that goes into that whole process, so happy to walk through that as well. Um, and then, yeah, I actually just started at FX on January 31st. So I've not even been here a month, but I, I had a relationship with the FX team because the agency I used to work for, um, our main client was FX. So 
a, another thing we can talk about is, you know, how to create relationships in the workplace and, and how to, you know, use LinkedIn, because that has definitely, definitely been a tool that I've used, um, you know, in the, in the past five years that I've been in, in my career. So, yeah, very excited to talk to you all and, and answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, I know that I'm really excited to have you here as someone who um, hopes to move out to LA after graduation and in May. So I will definitely be talking to you more in the breakout room. So thank you so much. Um, so moving on, we have uh, Lauren. Um, so Lauren Lawson is an external communications executive for Goodwill Industries International, North America's leader in work workforce um, training and development, job placement, and other supportive services for people looking for employment or career advancement. As spokesperson for Goodwill, she has been quoted frequently in the media, including the Associated Press, the New York Times, People, PR News, and USA Today, just to name a few. She has spent the majority of her career using marketing and communications to drive social change and impact and elevate brand awareness of mission-driven nonprofit organizations in both a for-profit and pro bono capacity. She is immediate past president of the Public Relations Society of America National Capital Chapter and serves on the editorial advisory board for PR Daily. Um, Lauren, I now would like to throw it to you. I know you have some slides prepared um, that I have included in this presentation. So just let me know when you would like me to um, transition between the next slides. Great, thank you, Zach. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I am not an alum, but I have spoken to the PR SSA chapter and also had a class of seniors work on a case study for Goodwill that informs solutions for building loyalty and awareness across the younger consumer base using sustainability messaging. And also had the opportunity to award Zach and Elizabeth with PRSA National Capital Chapter Awards. So wanted to personally congratulate them again. As Zach mentioned, I head up comms and PR at Goodwill. We are the, one of the leading nonprofit workforce providers in North America. I have a background in book publishing PR. I moved from New York to DC 20 years ago with the intent of pursuing a career in the nonprofit sector. And you can go to the next slide. Uh, because PR influences perceptions and decisions, my career purpose is to work for organizations who are mission driven and drive social change. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so I wanted to give some background about Goodwill and, and why I chose to work there. This is Goodwill's mission. Goodwill provides access to job training and placement, career advancement and wage increases, especially for marginalized communities. While Goodwill has a 94% brand recognition rate, which is really incredible because of our stores and name, people don't realize that there are stories behind the stores. So next slide. These are some of our impact stats from last year. Uh, we put 126,000 people to work in industries and communities across North America. We provided services to more than a million people. You can go to the next slide. But um, our 120 year old brand is at crossroads. You can go to the next slide. We, um, we need people to understand that Goodwill empowers people with the tools and resources to find a new path. And as an example, I wanted to briefly walk you through a B2B initiative that I launched in the spring of this year, and it's called Rising Together. And its focus, you can go to the next slide, is on funding and in-kind services from global and philanthropic partners and Fortune 50 companies. You can go to the next slide. Uh, and the next slide. So it's a first of a kind initiative. It provides a combination of holistic workforce solutions and supports to really address the systematic barriers facing workers in our society and the widening skills gap. And this is something that we saw with COVID. It really lifted the veil on inequities in our society, but we've known that at Goodwill. We've been around for 120 years. We're embedded in every community. So rising together, you can go to the next slide, has a goal of empowering more than 1 million people, 400,000 people a year by 2025 with sustainable careers 
and generate $170 million a year in funding. It's an integrating campaign with earned media. You can go to the next slide. Sponsored content, next slide. And digital advertising that has positioned our CEO as a thought leader for the monthly jobs reports and in the workforce space. You can go to the next slide. Uh, we've also done digital advertising, which uh, has had millions of impressions. So I showcase this as an impactful example of the work that you can do in the nonprofit and cause related space. And then I wanted to leave you with some personal professional advice and things that I learned along the way. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Keep going. So you, one is you can't be an expert in the whole business and you have to learn to harness the expertise that you need. Don't get lost in the tactics and really take it easy. Everything that is happening right now is preparing you for the next great thing. And my additional advice and what I give to uh, students is to be a lifelong learner, network, you can go to the next slide, be strategic in your work, join organizations like PRSA, uh, NCC, WWPR, seek out feedback, you can go to the next slide, and know that 85% of jobs in 2030 have not been invented yet. So you really have to be flexible, open to change, and continually enhance your skills. And I like to end with this quote. You can go to the next slide. Uh, this is just a favorite of mine because it really focuses on how meaningful cause-related work is. And I'm always inspired by my colleagues because we work tirelessly for the mission of Goodwill. We don't get a ticker, ticker tape parade, but we know that our work is for a higher purpose, that it has impact and really makes a difference. Uh, so I do encourage you to like and follow our channels and learn more. And I included that on the last slide and really appreciate your time and look forward to touching more in uh, the breakout room. And I also have my contact information here as well. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, and thank you so much for um, giving me and Elizabeth the service award this past January. Um, I know me and Elizabeth have already expressed our gratefulness, but I just wanted to take a moment to thank you again for that national recognition. It means a lot. Um, and so with that, we will move um, on with our next guest speaker, um, Carly Cody. Um, Carly is currently a program manager for the Overseas Security Advisor Council within the Office of Diplomatic Security at the U.S. Department of State. Carly is passionate about strengthening the relationship between the public and private sectors and international cooperation. Prior to this, she worked for the U.S. Navy Program Executive Office, facilitating international data exchange, um, during her undergraduate studies, Carly interned for the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, the French Ministry of Education, the U.S. Department of State, the Atlantic Council, and the House of Representatives. As a graduate of American University, Carly has a degree in public relations and strategic communication and minors in French and international studies, encompassing a focus on global communication. Outside of the class, she served as events director and president of American University's PRSSA um, and continues to volunteer with the PRSA National Capital chapter um, and is also AU's university's uh, liaison. Um, and in her spare time, she enjoys being with friends, family, traveling, and practicing her French. Um, and with that, Carly, I invite you to the virtual stage. I know you also have some slides prepared. Um, so just like for Lauren, I have them already queued up. Um, so just let me know when you would like me to continue on. Carly, are you are you still with us? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. I must have um, <laughs> mute. I apologize. Um, I was just expressing my gratitude and thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, but uh, let's get started. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, uh, thanks for giving me the honor of serving as one of the professional gurus. Um, like Zach said, my name is Carly and I graduated from American in 2019. I currently work at the U 
AOS Department of State as a program manager for the Overseas Security Advisory Council, which is also known as OSAC. I'm looking forward to sharing my experiences and hearing from you all this evening. So as Zach mentioned, oh, Zach, I'm sorry, you can go back to the next or the previous slide. Thank you. Um, I started at AU as an international studies major, but after taking uh, a few courses, I decided it wasn't the right. I wanted to do something, but um, on an international scale, and AU helped me identify what that something was. I switched to public relations and strategic communication because I wanted to learn how to be an effective communicator and transfer that skill set into my professional career. I found having the foundation of a communications degree has proven extremely transferable to almost all fields, which we can definitely tell from all of the professional gurus we've had speak tonight. There's an undeniable work culture in Washington, D.C., and while this may seem the norm while you're surrounded by it, it's not the case across the country necessarily. It's important to take advantage of the environment you're so fortunate to be a part of right now, and it, as it really sets you apart from your peers. Personally, after graduating, I started my career in Paris with a program called TAPEF, the French uh, government's version of the Fulbright English teaching program. Unfortunately, like others, uh, my time was cut short due to the pandemic, and I was transplanted back um, in March 2020 uh, unemployed. I was provided the opportunity to work at the U.S. Helsinki Commission through an opportunity I was able to be connected to through PRSSA, and I was so fortunate to then support and start my career with the U.S. Navy and then land um, in my position today as of January 2022. I firmly believe that your professional career only works if you do, and I can't deny that sometimes it's not without a little luck. My current position presented itself to me while I was seeking something different, um, but I took a chance and I'm so glad I did. The next slide, please. So this overwhelming infographic is kind of an overview of the State Department. Um, the highlighted section is the Bureau of Diplomatic Security, which is where I fall, um, also known as DS. Um, the Bureau of Diplomatic Security acts of the, as the law enforcement and security arm of the State Department. And as you can see, like I mentioned, this is where my office falls. Next slide, please. OSAC serves as a partnership between the Department of State and the private sector security community, enabling safe operations of US organizations overseas through threat alerts, analysis, and peer network groups. And that's where I wanna emphasize some of the communications building skills really come in in inter interpersonal relationships. On the screen, you can see the various teams within the office. My position in the programs, partnerships, and policy team collaborates in regional and sector-specific committees to keep private sector members informed, connected, and better equipped to manage complex security challenges around the world, like the Ukraine crisis we're seeing right now. Some of the regional and sector committees that um, my office covers include um, Europe and the East Asia Pacific region, Middle East, North Africa, uh, women in security, cybersecurity, and media and entertainment, just to name a few. Next slide, please. I got into this industry. Um, I was first introduced with my internship with the State Department during my undergraduate career. And like I mentioned earlier, I've really emphasized taking advantage of all that DC has to offer. Um, my internship identified the sector as something I was interested in pursuing in undergrad, but then I did not know about the specific bureau office I currently am um, at that time. Some great successes that I have since experienced since starting um, was onboarding remotely during the pandemic, which um, most will find um, comes with its unique uh, learning and growing pains, but comes with a lot of independence. And um, I would just like to emphasize that you should acknowledge that things can move slowly, but continue to be proactive and respectful. Something unique that I found to be a great success in my role is the interagency networking. Uh, my role allows a lot of collaboration across um, different sectors and security information sharing, and I found that collaboration and networking really um, allows me to meet new people and create successful, trustworthy relationships. I'm currently working on, like I mentioned, the East Asia Pacific region. Um, a faith-based organization and media and entertainment. And so some of the partners that are in the media and entertainment um, sector, for example, are Disney or um, other newscast agencies that we communicate with on a regular basis. Um, 
some critical parts of my job responsibilities have really been fostering productive relationships and collaborations with those colleagues. And it just has allowed me to maintain awareness of some of the geopolitical events and identifying effective networks for our stakeholders. Next slide. So in closing, um, some of professional advice I would give for some students or new employees um, ready to enter the workforce would be this little acronym I like to kind of emphasize, and that's get to know the people. So be proactive, be excited, outgoing, passionate, likable, and an expert on their topical area. With that, um, make sure to market yourself. Make sure your resume and LinkedIn, like others have mentioned, are up to date and your materials are tailored to every job posting you're seeking. Um, network, 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 um, jo join those professional organizations just like this one and find those like-minded people um, that could uh, serve as mentors for you in the future. Or maybe you could even be exposed to a new sector that you didn't know about previously. Uh, COVID is an ever changing environment that we're all um, learning to kind of adapt and work in and make sure to make those extra efforts to connect with your colleagues and supervisors while in the office. And finally, um, I cannot stress this enough, never stop learning. Professional development is very important and the early stages of your career are critical foundational blocks to learn and grow from each experience. So take ownership of your professional career from day one and seek out those new opportunities. Next slide, please. And with that, I close today with my sincere thanks to the other panelists, students, and AU or PRSSA for having me. But please feel free to reach out at any time with the email provided and connect with me on LinkedIn. So thank you so much, Zach. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Carly. Um, uh, that was such a great informative presentation. I also want to say thank you and express my thankfulness. Um, I know that we connect a lot offline um, to help facilitate um, stuff with AU um, as a chapter for PRSSA. So thank you for all the work that you do to help support us as a chapter. I really appreciate it. Um, so now moving forward to our next half of the event. Um, so now we'll be transitioning into the breakout rooms. Um, so there are gonna be two different breakout rooms. One is titled entertainment um, slash sports. And in that breakout room, Alyssa and um, Ryan, if you could join those. Uh, that breakout room and then the other one will be um, government crisis and nonprofit themed um so that being said lauren um richard and carly if you could join that breakout room that'd be great um and like i said at the beginning of the event we will have roughly 10 to 15 minutes um to network in these breakout rooms so students please take advantage of this time um to ask any and all questions that you have um, I also have split up my eboard between the two breakout rooms, um, so you guys will be able to meet with them um, and connect with them as well. So at this time, we will transition into that portion of the event. I will stop sharing my screen for now. Um, and you, for those of you that don't see at the bottom um, of the Zoom screen, there's a breakout room tab. So if you click that, you can see um, the two different rooms and you can just go ahead and join whichever room um, you're interested in, in networking with. Here, there's so let me figure out how to, to stay. Um, I think why I've been here for so for the time that I have at this point is it's there's just so much. There's so much to <laughs> learn. There it's ever changing like um yeah, like even like social media, like like that's like a part of my job, but I also am working on advertising on TV. When you see anything on a billboard, when you see anything on a website, when you see anything on um, a print magazine, like it's just so broad. So it's just, it's, it's ever changing. It's, I'm always like, I think a lot of the, the speakers have already said, like be a student of what you continue to be a student, even, you know, in the workforce. And that's, I think, for me, I like continuing to learn. I like to continue to challenge myself. I and there just there's so many so many ways to do that um, in in media, but specifically in entertainment. Because even I guess when I when I had my internship at ESPN, that's when um, a lot of the conversations about like Netflix and Hulu were just like we get getting big, and a lot of the um, entertainment companies were like, well, how can we go direct to consumer? So that's now why you see. Peacock has an app and Disney plus and ESPN plus like all those conversations were like very hush hush and secretive when I was an intern five years ago and now look where we are with all these so yeah. <laughs> yeah I would say like 
sport and entertainment touches every single vertical of of, of life. Like it's it's crazy how many different avenues you can go with it. Um, and so like I could be working on something political because one of my athletes is an like an ambassador for Biden, or I could be working on an art project because like one of our clients into right. So it it kind of goes everywhere and, and everyone talks about sports and entertainment. So when you talk about like, why do you stick with it? One, it's, you're always learning. It's always changing. It's like kind of addicting, right? Like, and you also know, like what is going on in the world. You can go into any like random party and be able to carry a conversation because what you work on, everyone can relate to. Um, I will say that like the way I started my career and where I am now. So like I would work 24 seven because the industry's on 24 seven, right? And it's constantly going. And then now that I'm a little bit older, I'm like, I just wanna like be home on my couch. And so learning to like when to tap in and to tap out. And as you grow and like you build your team, but, like at the beginning of your career, it's like an addiction. Like there's so much happening and you wanna be a part of it. And I'm sorry, I do wanna add like to that question of, I will say like, Although my undergrad and graduate degree at American like set the foundation as far as strategic communications, advertising, PR and stuff, like when you get to the job, they will teach you what they need you to do. And so yes. you're constantly learning. So don't think like even if you maybe are in your degree now and you're not necessarily thinking like, I don't know if I want to be in media or entertainment or communications, what are you interested in? What do you want to do? for eight to 10 hours a day, every day. Like think of that. And I think that will help guide you. But like, of course the interview, your resume is very important, but once you get into the job, they will they will tell you, they will teach you, tell you, you will learn what you're supposed, you're there to do. I'd also add like the sports and entertainment industry above all industries values, like people skills more than anything else, right? Like being a good people person, carrying conversations, like being able to pick up the phone, talk to people, walk into a room and talk to a CEO, and then also be able to communicate with like the assistant, right? So like this industry is all about networking and like being approachable and like easy to work with. Thank you both so much. Yeah. Um, Jada, did you have your hand up earlier? Yeah, I did. I, I got ahead of myself, so I was like, let me, <laughs> let me lower it. But I wanted to know, um, Ryan, earlier in your, your slide, when you were um, giving your introduction, you were talking a little bit about the day-to-day -day with paid media. And I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I was wondering um, if you could touch on what the day-to-day -day is like at FX, because that's like, such a cool company to work for. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, I'm not even a month in, so I'm still learning. Um, at FX specifically, like I think in this new role, um, on I'm on the advertising and media team, I'm getting experience actually looking at each like advertising, like each piece of advertising and, and evaluating it and critiquing it on how does this have the best messaging? Is it portraying what we want to promote for this TV show? Does it have the right um, copy to say, it's coming on tonight, it's coming on this specific date, uh, binge watch it on Hulu, like all those very in the details. That's a lot of what my new job is. Um, it, through um, building up to now and media planning, that, that's kind of going back to what I was just saying of like, I, didn't, I don't remember having a class at AU about media planning and what that means, but I had an understanding of the advertising and marketing world from that degree. So when I started at the media agency, I had an understanding, but it's like, again, it's just a lot. Like there's so many specific um, nuances to each type of advertising and, and how it's done a lot. I'm sure uh, Alyssa can attend, but there's like a lot of acronyms <laughs> that you <laughs> have to learn uh, in, in, in the different industries. So it's just like, um, I think in my role, I kind of like it because it's like, I get to work on a variety of different things and learn about a lot of different advertising avenues. But then if you're if you're more interested in, in only TV, there are jobs specifically for knowing everything about how to buy and sell advertising space on TV. And so I don't know the weeds in the weeds of that. I don't know all of the ins and outs, but I have an understanding of the process and how it works and how to get my ad onto TV and I, for all the other avenues as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think we have Kath Catherine? Yeah, 
Hi, um, I had a question for you, Alyssa. I have a fairly similar background um, playing a sport in undergrad. And then I did a internship um, doing some sports communication as well. But I was wondering if you could give some insight onto what you're looking for on resumes. And even during an interview with a candidate, there are some other kind of um, soft skills or even hard skills that you're looking for aside from that sports experience. So yeah, I, I would say don't really look at the sports part of it. Um, the biggest things I look for when screening like resumes at first is um, our job is writing. A lot of it is writing and like talking to people. So if there are any errors in terms of like punctuations or inconsistencies or anything like that, like I look for that just to like eliminate people. That's the first thing I do because if you're not going to make that perfect, then why would I hire you? Um, the second thing when I get onto like a phone interview is just like the ease of the conversation, right? Like, are you able to naturally talk, ask questions, kind of go through that? I'd say that's more of like a soft skill. Um, what I ask for that's usually not on a resume is more writing samples. So whether that is like blog writing, social media copy, pitches, that kind of stuff, I like to read that and see how you write. Um, if you have success placing a story, you know, whether that's as a project or anything like that, I like to hear the examples and kind of hear your thought process and how you went through that. How did you pick the reporter? How, what were like the nuances that went into that? Um, but the other thing I look for is, and I said it, I think earlier is like diversity of thought. So like, were you, was your experience at a nonprofit? Was it, I don't know, at a music, something, what, so how are you different from me? That's like really what I because I don't need another me. Um, and so I look for like all types of experiences when, when looking at resumes. Uh, I'm going to jump in and add on to that because the point like resume, I haven't had as much experience with that. But as far as like in the interview process, I would absolutely agree with Alyssa. Like a lot of it I would recommend is like making it a conversation. Like it's an interview for you, but it's also you're interviewing them. Do you want to work at that company? So make it a conversation, definitely ask questions. Um, I would say a one way to um, kind of understand the success of an interview is if you get them talking more than you. Like that's like, oh, then they want you, they wanna sell themselves to you to get you to work there. So I would say that. And then also truly, truly use LinkedIn. I've just cold, not cold call, but just randomly message. Like if someone works at a company that you're interested in, literally just reach out to them. Like that's what Jim did to get me here today. She was like, hey, can you join this? Like people are happy to share the information. So like, just reach out. Like people are nice and, and want to share. All righty. It looks like we have one minute. So if anyone has any last questions, now's the time. All righty. Well, Zach, do you have anything to add before we switch? Um, I just want to just reiterate my gratefulness and thanks to both of you, Alyssa um, and Ryan. Um, I know that uh, this break room is like uh, right about to close, um, so I wasn't able to ask all my questions, um, but I will definitely connect with you guys via email, like offline, um, as I'm very interested in pursuing the entertainment um, industry, entertainment sports industry after graduation. Um, so I really appreciate you guys um, coming out tonight. Yes, I have something to add quickly. Would you mind if we reach out to you on LinkedIn if we have any further questions or just anything like that? Go for it. Okay, awesome. Well, that's great to know. All right, so we're going to switch groups, which means that both um, Alyssa and Ryan can stay here and then new people will be joining. Correct. Thank you. About that, guys, if you guys got caught off um, mid sentence, um, we are now just going to transition um, into like switch breakout rooms. So if you were, in the government crisis nonprofit and want to talk to the people in entertainment sports, feel free at this time to join those breakout rooms and vice versa. I just want to make sure all students have the opportunity to connect with um, all of our guests. Um, but if you are if you are liking your breakout room you're currently we're in, feel free to stay, chat, network. Um, but I did want to bring that opportunity to everyone. So and they called themselves Goodwill. So I spent the third day on the job staying until 10 o'clock at night calling every national media outlet saying it's not Goodwill as in Goodwill the nonprofit. Um, and so I say that because you just said you have to cut your teeth on the real world crisis experience. It's not something that you're going to learn in a textbook. 
Um, you know, there's the golden hour, which is the, the first, um, I see Richard nodding, but that's, that's when you have to respond to a crisis. And that time has gotten shorter over time because of social media. So now they say news breaks on social media and traditional media is catching up. Um, so it's really just focusing on your stakeholders, acknowledging the crisis in real time. For me, I'm often still trying to find out what happened, what's the situation, who's going to be the spokesperson. But as long as you're acknowledging that on social channels and saying we're aware, because public wants trust in your brand, so that's really important to do. And then, um, you know, something that we've done at, at Goodwill is we went off site and we wrote down every crisis situation that could happen. Um, if it's a natural disaster, if it's a train derailment, if it's embezzlement, and then the crisis scenario messaging that we would use to respond to that. Um, so as much as you can, you can prepare for crises, but I, you know, we just went through the pandemic and we had 97% of our stores closed and there was no playbook for that because we've never dealt with anything like that before. Uh, so, you know, again, a lot of it just comes from being in the thick of it, um, but there are certainly things that, you know, I'm happy to share some crisis resources that I've put together um, with all of you. It's a, Katie, it's a great question, but, you know, Lauren closed with how I usually open with that, uh, when I get that question, which is, and, and people don't, you know, students don't like that, the, my answer, which is, the best experience is experience and you just, you know, you need time on the planet. And I know that's not very helpful, but I, you know, I, I do have to tell you, so I'm, I'm in, uh, um, so let's say there's a um, river, I, I'm sorry, let me try to respond to this river and then I'll respond to your question that you uh, typed in. So I'm in uh, Texas earlier this week and we do some of the work we do is high net worth individuals, you know, billionaires and whatnot. And they have, you know, you, you, everyone thinks that someone who's a multimillionaire or a billionaire, it's got it made, they've got it made. But really, when you're in, in that level, you're a target for everything. And you spend a lot of your life fending off all sorts of things. And you don't know who to trust, including your spouses. It's, it can be very challenging. And the topic that came up, there was, uh, as is often the case, succession, and there was there were death issues. People had died, and uh, what this particular person had felt, and whatnot. And this is not going to be very helpful to you, but I've had a lot of uh, unexpected death in my life, and as a result, could be very empathetic and understood exactly where she was coming from. So get as many experiences as you can, because that makes you a better person. And it makes you a richer person, but it also allows you to reach across the aisle to look at people and say, I understand and to really, really understand. And so I think that's really helpful. Now, what can you do practically? So I think I mentioned briefly, I teach at Fordham Law, those students are older, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s. And, and they're all professionals. And yet it's still, what I'm about to suggest is still a challenge for them, which is I said, you know, we're in the habit of reading newspaper stories or watching crises unfold on TV as if we're a spectator. I want you to stop yourself from now on. And next time you see something or you read something, I want you to say, oh, I would never do that. Or, you know, I'm uh, one of my degrees is from Michigan, you know, watching Juwan Howard uh, attack the Wisconsin assistant coach, really it was absolutely the wrong thing to do. But I would be thinking if I were representing Michigan here, how would I help them? And I want you to be reading the newspaper from now on and say, instead of saying, oh, Juwan Howard, what a terrible thing that he did say, well, wait a minute, if we're representing him, what are we doing? And the same is true on any issue you read about right now. If you were representing uh, the president of Ukraine, what would be your message? How would you handle it? If you were representing Vladimir Putin, and by the way, the Russians came to us a few years ago, we didn't take the work, obviously, but if we did, what would our message be uh, right now? Try, when you read things, pick a side you don't like, and in your head, think through, okay, what would I do? What would the timeline be? What would the messaging be? Who would the allies be? What's likely to happen next? Because all crisis has an arc. What's going to happen next? And as a result, what we do. And Katie, that doesn't give you the experience straight off. But what it does do 
is it allows you to start critical thinking. And most people don't think at that level. And that will make you special. And then the last thing I'll say is, we're a little bit unusual in that we're very close with a lot of our competitors. Um, and anyone who, you know, who wants to end a crisis, who wants to email me, and uh, Zach, I'm sure has my contact information, but I'm, you know, if we're not hiring, and we tend not to hire undergraduates, but if we're not hiring, you know, we can introduce you to uh, Bob Klopak's agency or Edelman, or, you know, half a dozen other firms where we're just really close and have great relationships. Thank you all for those answers. I appreciate it. Um, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You had your hand up. Up to you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question for Carly, actually. So I just want to hear more about um, the environment you work in every day for crisis PR at the State Department. And if you can discuss more about just what your everyday um, kind of career looks like. Sure. Um, it's not specifically crisis, I would say. I would say we do mitigate some crisis with some of those other teams that I referenced earlier. Um, for example, we have a research and analysis team who specifically would deal with um, some of the crises. We have a global threat team that actually sits in a secure area and reaches out um, and tracks some of those crises and has what's called the duty to warn. So then we'll take and um, kind of notify our private sector partners of some crises they're tracking. So I don't specifically deal with that. Um, my role kind of in communications is more of the network building. We facilitate the communications and the conversations between the State Department and the private sector. So that's just ensuring the open lines of communication and sometimes that's um, kind of assist with preventing crises before they even start or happen. Um, but uh, on a day to day, I would say um, it's definitely more of just networking and continuing that relationship building rather than specific crises. Um, but if you have any additional questions, I hope I addressed it, but I'm happy to expand. No, thank you so much. All right, whoever was going next, you can go. Um, I also had a question for Carly. Uh, my name is Cyrus Butler. I'm studying PR and strategic communications as well. Uh, I also came in through SIS and then I was looking for something different and found PR. So I'm enjoying it. I've been enjoying it. I was just wondering if you could talk more about your uh, what you said about people, um, about your, your uh, acronym, and if um, if you could touch on on some of the, some of the ways you know how to uh, or have helped you diversify like your your job search and sure and, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say I commend that switch because it's definitely a tough one, one and I still think about today, but what really kind of fueled my transition was I wanted to learn how to be an effective communicator overall and then communicate about what I was passionate about, which happened to be international or SIS. So um, I really used personally undergrad and after graduating as um, the way to kind of diversify my experiences and just cast a wide net. And I can recommend that anymore. Um, take those passions that have been um, kind of suggested by um, the other professionals and definitely start there, but really kind of hone in and see if you can um, find maybe where those passions lie in a different area. I cannot re recommend LinkedIn and um, informal networking um, anymore. And this is a good face-to-face -face way to start um, and then pursue relationships that way. Um, but also just look on Indeed. I have, to this day, I have alerts, you know, every day just seeing what kind of new organizations or companies are out there maybe with just a couple of keywords so I can see what kind of industries are involved in that. Um, so I'd recommend that because um, there's a lot I don't know about and I'm still learning about, um, but that's something I would definitely recommend doing um, to kind of kickstart your career. Mm. Could you share your uh, the the people uh, the acronym again? Like what, what each uh, what each letter meant? Sure. Um, for uh, my office, just that one. Um. Or what people acronym? You, oh, oh, you sure. said P E. Sure. That was really um just an informal kind of uh thing I like saying, but I said essentially I just use people as kind of being proactive in your search. Um, go into every opportunity excited. That's the E, be outgoing and out, get out of your comfort zone. 
um, be passionate about whatever kind of like Mr. Levick said, if, if you're going to be an expert in two things, be passionate about those two things and bring that to the table. Um, be, I just said likable, be friendly and um, open to new opportunities. And then again, be an expert on like Mr. Levick said, maybe those two things and bring that to the table and your experiences. Thank you. So I had a question for Mr. Levick. Um, besides insensitivity, what do you think is the great, greatest weakness in modern communications from a hiring and crisis communications perspective? First of all, Gemma, I'm never going to work with you again because everyone's calling me Mr. Levick. So I'm like, okay, do I have to re-up my AARP membership? Is that what's happening here? So Kiara, great question. Thanks so much for asking. And, you know, I think insensitivity is, is a huge one because, you know, as I've mentioned, I think we tend to be very American centric and we tend to be very local and, and don't have a, a global view. But having said that, one of the things that amazes me, and I wonder how many of you, you know, Carly and, uh, and, and Lauren have had this experience, how many empty suits there are in Washington. I mean, I hate saying that, but you know, I always think if I want to make a couple million dollars, I'm opening a men's store and all we're going to have is empty suits. You know, that's what we're going to sell. And you know, what is an empty suit? It's people who look really good, who sound really good and don't do anything, can't do anything. And I'll tell you, after 25 years, many, many hundreds of employees, I am amazed at how the number and it doesn't I don't mean to say that this is a lot, but that the fact that there are even a number of them, how many empty suits there were, people who were former ambassadors, former members of Congress, you know, Gemma, you know what I'm talking about, and then you hire them and they sit there and they wait for the phone to ring. And you know, there's a the, the folded tent syndrome, you go into a meeting and they go, hmm, let me think about that. That's a really deep question. And I think one of the greatest things is I, I share with you that a uh, young professional and my team, and, and we've got many like this, but knowing that people are, they're, you're really good at what you do and you're hard workers and you're not afraid of hard work and you're not afraid of challenges. And I love what Lauren said and Carly said earlier, you're always growing. And the only way to be always growing is to constantly be exceeding your grasp. Your reach exceeds your grasp. And that you can't do things that are too far but it's one or two or maybe three phases beyond what you can do. I mean, I, you know, I got asked today, this morning, out of the, uh, to do a what we call an A B analysis. If this, then that, um, regarding uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine on legal and business and international issues. You know, we had to turn it around right away. I've never written that before. And there's so much breaking so quickly, but the, you want to get comfortable with these things and not be afraid. Ask for help when you need it. Give credit to others. Always listen aggressively. Um, I never learn anything when I'm talking. And, uh, you know, uh, someone asked about the podcast. It just made me a much better listener too. Um, and I know I've already uh, raised the Buddhist before. And if you're looking at books, by the way, Thich Nhat Hanh, who just passed away, Peace with Every Step, that book of all his books is really terrific. <laughs> Pardon me, but see the connection between all things. And I don't mean that there's a direct connection like, oh, if I got a fender bender this morning, then the rest of the day is going to be rotten. I mean, there's, there, you know, understand and see how everything is not connected, but also connected. It helps us be more present, more thoughtful, more, more helpful. If you don't understand something, learn it. And Kira, you know, you said, you know, what are some of the weaknesses? I'm amazed at how many people think that they know it all already. Oh, and last thing I'll say is never sell alone. You think like the client, be, you know, um, uh, you're always better as a team. I've been doing this for 40 years and I always prefer to have someone else on the phone with me. And I don't, you know, that, that's, that, and I mean that if you're selling, but I mean that if you're working for someone, because you're so busy thinking about what you're going to say next that you don't have time to think about the big picture, having other people there just makes you so much stronger. The, the whole is much bigger than the sum of the parts.
Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and and Kara, I'm reading your note now that you actually you you meant you were focusing on sensitivity. I think sensitivity is. Um, you don't want to be so sensitive that you're immobilized. Sometimes you may need to make really, really hard decisions. Um, Absolutely. Right. You know, I mean, after right after 9-11, we were hired by the Arabs, you know, on, you know, uh, which was incredibly unpopular, but incredibly important. But you have to you have to be sensitive to other people's plights and perspectives. Of course. Thank you. Thank I you. have a question real quick for Lauren. And Lauren, I love what you said at the very end that in the year 20, what was it, 20, 30 something? 2030. Jobs, their job mm -hmm. students don't even know are existing, but that right. that it's important to have these basic skills. Do you want to just touch on that real quick for the last few moments? Yeah, um, I spoke at my commencement speech for my alma mater in 2012 and said the same thing. And it's just you know, sometimes I have hired um, staff that throw their hands up and say, well, we don't have budget or we don't have the skills to do this. And you just really have to be open minded and flexible and, and see what um, the pot creative and see what the possibilities are. But Hi again, we're back. <laughs> I did not realize it was going to bring everyone back to the main room. <laughs> Um, okay, people are trickling in. Um, I guess I I can start off um, this this one. Um, so Ryan, my question to you, as someone who is approaching their graduation, um, and I know there are some students in this breakout room that are also graduating in May. What are just some tips and advice that you have just for graduating seniors that are hoping to pursue the entertainment space? Yeah. Um, so to be completely transparent, I did not, when I graduated undergrad, I did not know what I wanted to do. It wasn't until I graduated grad school where I had a better understanding. Um, but I will say, um, like I kind of mentioned in, in the main session, I looked at a lot of like T. Howard Foundation, the Grant Foundation are two that are coming to mind. I think Emma Bowen might be another one, but those are kind of, um, foundations that help with scholarships, um, Internship, internships and even job placement um, in many here. So let me figure out how to, to stay. Um, I think why I've been here for so for the time that I have at this point is it's there's just so much. There's so much to <laughs> learn. There it's ever changing. Like um, yeah, like even like social media, like like that's like a part of my job, but I also am working on advertising on TV. When you see anything on a billboard, when you see anything on a website, when you see anything on um, a print magazine, like it's just so broad. So it's just, it's, it's ever changing. It's, I'm always like, I think a lot of the, the speakers have already said, like be a student of what you continue to be a student, even, you know, in the workforce. And that's, I think, for me, I like continuing to learn. I like to continue to challenge myself. I and there are just there's so many so many ways to do that um, in in media, but specifically in entertainment. Because even I guess when I when I had my internship at ESPN, that's when um, a lot of the conversations about like Netflix and Hulu were just like we get getting big, and a lot of the um, entertainment companies were like, well, how can we go direct to consumer? So that's now why you see. Peacock has an app and Disney plus and ESPN plus like all those conversations were like very hush hush and secretive when I was an intern five years ago and now look where we are with all these so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say like sport and entertainment touches every single vertical of, of, of life like it, it's crazy how many different avenues you can go with it. Um, and so like I could be working on something political because one of my athletes is an, like an ambassador for Biden, or I could be working on an art project because like one of our clients, right? So it, it kind of goes everywhere and, and everyone talks about sports and entertainment. So when you talk about like, why do you stick with it? One, it's, you're always learning. It's always changing. It's like kind of addicting, right? Like, and you also know, like what is going on in the world. You can go into any like random party and be able to carry a conversation because what you work on, everyone can relate to. Um, I will say that like the way I started my career and where I am now. So 
like I would work 24 seven because the industry's on 24 seven, right? And it's constantly going. And then now that I'm a little bit older, I'm like, I just wanna like be home on my couch. And so learning to like when to tap in and to tap out. And as you grow and like you build your team, but like at the beginning of your career, it's like an addiction. Like there's so much happening and you wanna be a part of it. And I sorry, I do wanna add like to that question of, I will say like, Although my undergrad and graduate degree at American like set the foundation as far as strategic communications, advertising, PR and stuff, like when you get to the job, they will teach you what they need you to do. And so yes. you're constantly learning. So don't think like, even if you maybe are in your degree now and you're not necessarily thinking like, I don't know if I wanna be in media or entertainment or communications, what are you interested in? What do you want to do? for eight to 10 hours a day, every day. Like think of that. And I think that will help guide you. But like, of course the interview, your resume is very important, but once you get into the job, they will they will tell you, they will teach you, tell you, you will learn what you're supposed, you're there to do. I'd also add like the sports and entertainment industry above all industries values, like people skills more than anything else, right? Like being a good people person, carrying conversations, like being able to pick up the phone, talk to people, walk into a room and talk to a CEO, and then also be able to communicate with like the assistant, right? So like this industry is all about networking and like being approachable and like easy to work with. Thank you both so much. Um, Jada, did you have your hand up earlier? Yeah, I did. I I got ahead of myself, so I was like, let me <laughs> let me lower it. But I wanted to know, um, Ryan, earlier in your your slide, when you were um, giving your introduction, you were talking a little bit about the day to day with paid media. And I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I was wondering um, if you could touch on what the day to day is like at FX, because that's like such Ooh. a cool company to work for. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, I'm not even a month in, so I'm still learning. Um, at FX specifically, like I think in this new role, um, on I'm on the advertising and media team, I'm getting experience actually looking at each like advertising, like each piece of advertising and, and evaluating it and critiquing it on how does this have the best messaging? Is it portraying what we want to promote for this TV show? Does it have the right um, copy to say, it's coming on tonight, it's coming on this specific date, uh, binge watch it on Hulu, like all those very in the details. That's a lot of what my new job is. Um, it, through um, building up to now and media planning, that, that's kind of going back to what I was just saying of like, I, didn't, I don't remember having a class at AU about media planning and what that means, but I had an understanding of the advertising and marketing world from that degree. So when I started at the media agency, I had an understanding, but it's like, again, it's just a lot. Like there's so many specific um, nuances to each type of advertising and, and how it's done. A lot, I'm sure uh, Alyssa can attend, but there's like a lot of acronyms <laughs> that you <laughs> have to learn uh, in, in, in the different industries. So it's just like, um, I think in my role, I kind of like it because it's like, I get to work on a variety of different things and learn about a lot of different advertising avenues. But then if you're if you're more interested in, in only TV, there are jobs specifically for knowing everything about how to buy and sell advertising space on TV. And so I don't know the weeds in the weeds of that. I don't know all of the ins and outs, but I have an understanding of the process and how it works and how to get my ad onto TV and I, for all the other avenues as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think we have Catherine. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, I had a question for you, Alyssa. I have a fairly similar background um, playing a sport in undergrad. And then I did a internship um, doing some sports communication as well. But I was wondering if you could give some insight onto what you're looking for on resumes. And even during an interview with a candidate, there are some other kind of um, soft skills or even hard skills that you're looking for aside from that sports experience? So yeah, I would say don't really look at the sports part of it. Um, the biggest things I look for when screening like resumes at first is um, our job is writing a lot of it. It's writing and like talking to people. So if there are any 
errors in terms of like punctuations or inconsistencies or anything like that, like I look for that just to like eliminate people. That's the first thing I do, because if you're not going to make that perfect, then why would I hire you? Um, the second thing when I get onto like a phone interview is just like the ease of the conversation, right? Like, are you able to naturally talk, ask questions, kind of go through that? I say that's more of like a soft skill. Um, what I ask for that's usually not on a resume is more writing samples. So whether that is like blog writing, social media copy, pitches, that kind of stuff, I like to read that and see how you write. Um, if you have success placing a story, you know, whether that's as a project or anything like that, I like to hear the examples and kind of hear your thought process and how you went through that. How did you pick the reporter? How, what were like the nuances that went into that? Um, but the other thing I look for is, and I said it, I think earlier is like diversity of thought. So like, were you, was your experience at a nonprofit? Was it, I don't know, at a music, something, what, so how are you different from me? That's like really what I need, cause I don't need another me. Um, and so I look for like all types of experiences when, when looking at resumes. Uh, I'm going to jump in and add on to that. Cause the point like resume, I haven't had as much experience with that, but as far as like in the interview process, I would absolutely agree with Alyssa. Like a lot of it I would recommend is like making it a conversation. Like it's an interview for you, but it's also you're interviewing them. Do you want to work at that company? So make it a conversation, definitely ask questions. Um, I would say a one way to um, kind of understand the success of an interview is if you get them talking more than you. Like that's like, oh, then they want you, they want to sell themselves to you to get you to work there. So I would say that. And then also truly, truly use LinkedIn. I've just cold, not cold call, but just randomly message. Like if someone works at a company that you're interested in, literally just reach out to them. Like that's what Jim did to get me here today. She was like, hey, can you join this? Like people are happy to share the information. So like, just reach out. Like people are nice and they want to share. All righty. It looks like we have one minute. So if anyone has any last questions, now's the time. All righty. Well, Zach, do you have anything to add before we switch? Um, I just want to just reiterate my gratefulness and thanks to both of you, Alyssa um, and Ryan. Um, I know that uh, this break room is like a right about to close, um, so I wasn't able to ask all my questions, um, but I will definitely connect with you guys via email, like offline, um, as I'm very interested in pursuing the entertainment um, industry, entertainment sports industry after graduation. Um, so I really appreciate you guys um, coming out tonight. Yes, I have something to add quickly. Would you mind if we reach out to you on LinkedIn if we have any further questions or just anything like that? Go for it. Okay, awesome. Well, that's great to know. All right, so we're gonna switch groups, which means that both um, Alyssa and Ryan can stay here and then new people will be joining. Correct. Thank Um, I hope you guys had a great um, time in your breakout rooms and were able to network and um, talk to our guest speakers. Um, I just wanted to bring everyone back, um, sorry, as we just close out the event, um, give some closing remarks, and then I will let you all go for the evening. Um, so without further ado, I just wanted to uh, just take a moment to thank our wonderful guests this evening, Alyssa, Richard, Ryan, Lauren, and Carly. Um, I cannot express how much gratitude I have for you guys um, taking time out of your busy schedules to come speak to us tonight. Um, I know a lot of students were on the call and I'm sure they all appreciated getting the opportunity to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. And I know, you know, with this virtual format, there were some logistical issues. So thank you all for bearing with me. Um, I wish this was in person, but you know, we wanted to make sure we were safe um, with the pandemic and everything. Um, and for the students who are on the call that are interested in becoming a PRSA member, um, dues just got extended from March 1st to March 15th. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to email me at president at AUPRSA.org um, and also visit our website at AUPRSA.org. Um, and yeah, thank you to everyone who came out tonight and I hope you all have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Have a great day.